these lectures on African civilizations and cultures. First of all, let me talk about God in African belief. Most Africans believe not in one God, but in a pantheon of gods. And at the same time, they believe that there is one omnipotent God, one powerful God, that you have to approach through these several little gods. That's what I call pantheon of gods. These little gods are variously called in Nigeria different names. But the Almighty God is, is, is approached with reference in Igbo as Chuku, in Yoruba as Olon or Uluwa or Ulodumari, among the Edo as Osanobua, among the Hausa before the advent of Islam was known as Ubangiji. The ethics also called the same god, Abasi. But apart from this, for those of you who are Yorubas, we have gods like Ubu, Oya, Shango, and so on and so forth. But the omnipotent god, the idea of an omnipotent god is present in African civilization. Uh, these omnipotent gods, how to be approached, uh, through lesser gods. Uh, in the history of Africa, powerful figures, particularly kings, are sometimes deified and worshipped. In pre-colonial Africa, was pervasive and ruled the lives of our people, especially about what to eat, what not to eat, our moral behavior, our abstinence sometimes, and good neighborliness. African societies were simple, and their ways of life, the ways of life of African people, shunned corruption and lack of integrity that are common today. Now, let us break and talk about gender and culture in Africa. Most African societies are patrilinear. This is to say, descent from the father, descent is traced from the father, and it carries further implications. The man is the dominant figure in African societies. He has almost all rights, including right to marry more than one wife. The children belong to him, and he can send the wife away and retain his children. Of course, there are certain societies in Africa that are matrilinear, that is where descent is traced through the mother. Notable among these matrilinear societies are the Akan-speaking people of Ghana, the Shekiri of Nigeria, the Berum, and Jarawa on the Joss Plateau. In the matrilineal societies, children of a married cannot inherit directly from their fathers. Rather, it is the children of the father's sisters that has more claims to the man's inheritance. This may sound rather uh, difficult to understand, but this is the reality. This, of course, may differ from one matrilineal society to another. Among the Shekiris, for example, the place of the mothers is very strong, and the children belong to the mothers. Among the Jarawa and the Bero, the role of men is reversed, and it is the women who marry men and can dismiss them whenever she wants and replace them with other men. It is like patriarchy turned upside down. Generally, daughters cannot inherit land from their fathers, and this is most extreme among the Igbos. Marriage is not based on love, 
but on the ability of the man to sustain the union. And sometimes girls are driven out in marriage, are given out in marriage as a sign of friendship between the father and another man. Marriage is arranged, and the age of the man is usually not taken into cognizance or into account. Instances abound where 60, 70 year old men are given obescent girls for marriage. The economic situation of women is therefore very subservient to that of men. Unless a woman runs away from a matrimonial home, she cannot be an independent economic player. All this was in the past. Things, of course, thankfully, are changing. Women rear the children, and men most times find it below them to participate in taking care of their children. Yet, women are also used as farm hands and almost bits of body, carrying farm goods home sometimes from distant farms. Women do the frying of cassava into gari. They also weave the materials for their children's clothing. In the past, almost every woman in Nigeria had a, a, a weaver behind her, her home so that school children's uniform were usually woven at home and then given to, t t to tailors. They, of course, prepare the food and serve their husbands as masters, sometimes on bended knees. The totality of the life of a woman in traditional African society is that of subservience. In some extreme cases, like among the Izon, that is in job, the Shekiri, the Urobo, and most people in the Niger Delta, it is the women who farm and fish, while the men stay home and drink Ogogoro. Sometimes the lives of women can be very short if not nasty and brutish. All women were subject to circumcision, which today is called female genital mutilation. Thus, the art of love making in traditional African society is for procreation, that is, of having children. And women are merely used as carrying vessels during pregnancies. In spite of all this, Sometimes men and women grow to love themselves and to become genuine partners and companions. But it is generally an unequal partnership, like that between a horse and its rider. Now, let us break and talk briefly about, about indigenous health practices. Now, Let's go to another topic uh, in this series of uh, lectures. I want to talk about indig indigenous health practices, that is, health practices that we had before the advent of uh, colonial rule, or even be before the contact with uh, the Islamic world. One thing I must say is that we survived as Africans before contact with Western medicine. And many Africans today still don't even take advantage of Western medicine. They still prefer the traditional African medical practices that they and their, their ancestors are used to. African medicine was based on herbs, that is, it was herbal. Our people knew what leaves to grind or which ones to soak in water and rinse out the juice to drink for all kinds of ailments, especially malaria that is endemic in this area. Uh, malaria has been endemic in the, West, in the African region, particularly in tropical Africa for millennia. So our people knew how to cope with it, you know, using herbal medicine. Uh, Sometimes roots and other herbal mixtures 
are also put in food to be taken by Africans against all kinds of diseases. African news about prophylactics and had a crude idea of immunization. For example, in Guinea worm infected areas, slaves cooked in soups were recommended as prevention. This is somehow scientific in the sense that sometimes snails are opposed to guinea worm. Incision of sharp knives into several parts of the body into which medicines are wrought is not unlike Western medicine of injection uh, and they were effective and efficacious. Chanting of incantations were sometimes used to mesmerize opponents or to psychologically cure diseases because after all, believing the practice of incantations is one step towards a cure. For sprains, Africans use shea butter to rub such sprains. And when malaria strikes, apart from drinking the liquids of squeezed out of certain kinds of leaves, Africans sometimes, unlike Western medicine, will cover up the patients until it starts sweating. And when you sweat during malaria, you get uh, relief. In child delivery, this was usually done at home by trained African midwives who were usually elderly people in the community and would manipulate the baby while still inside the mothers for safe delivery. In snake or scorpion bite, incision usually will be made on the point of contact and the poison squeezed out of the patient before it reaches the heart. In cases of fractures, the leg or hand will be put between flat wound and bound together while the leg of a chicken, for example, will be broken. And the same treatment will be given the chicken as a person. And as the person and the chicken heal, it has psychological effect on the man or woman with the broken leg. In all, African medicine was based on psychology and, if you like, psychiatric treatment of the patient. For example, medicines will usually be taken in the middle of the night and the patient will be asked not to speak to any person after that and not to be sexually related and not to have conjugal relationship with the partner or face certain directions when taking the medicines. All these were psychological methods of care, and it worked. In the case of insanity, usually, the patient will be tied down and confined and psychologically treated in order to elicit whatever problems must have led to the insanity. Finally, the place of traditional African care system and herbal medicine is now being refined and adopted, not only in Africa, but everywhere. Because herbal medicine, if well measured, is not toxic and could indeed do a lot of good for the patient. Uh, the late Professor Adeo Ilambo made a name for himself in psychiatry by mixing Western psychiatric method with traditional African psychiatry. Now, I would like now to talk about African traditional family system. African traditional family system. The idea of a nuclear family is alien to the African. Family structure is the extended family structure. Sometimes in small villages and towns, everybody is related. In Africa, I believe it takes a village to train a child. Every older person or member of a village has responsibility towards the training and upbringing of a child. An elder can chastise and even flog a child. The man is the head of the family. There is an African saying that I love my wife 
but I'm the king in the family. Ordinarily, Africans relate intimately with their parents and their parents' parents and their parents' parents' parents, which means relationship with 16 different linear families. When they get married, they are also related to their spouses, immediate parents, grandparents and on both sides. This is why it is sometimes difficult for Africans to marry within their villages. They have to go out. This is called exogamous marriage. Africans are exogamous in marriage. They don't marry their cousins and sexual relationship, relationship between cousins is taboo. Of course, there are exceptions to this rule. Among the Fulani, for example, I, I believe they took this from the Arabs. They marry their cousins and it has some deleterious effect on their health. If, for example, your cousin is diabetic and you, you are also diabetic, you marry each other, of course, all your children will be diabetic. Children are reared together by the extended family and grandparents play significant roles in bringing up children and sometimes in spoiling their grandchildren in the process. Any financially strong members of the extended family are expected to take care of the less privileged in the family. Indeed, the concept of each person being his brother's keeper is very much an African concept. When a father dies and leaves behind a young wife, or when an older brother dies and leaves behind a young wife, the next of kin is expected to inherit the young wife and her children and are expected to treat them as